So I'm guessing if you've been married for like longer than a month, you probably have become accustomed to disappointment. (laughs) It's part of relationship. There's no way around it. Every relationship has it. But how you manage the disappointment, now that means everything. So in this video, I want to give you five tips for managing disappointment in your marriage. Before I jump in, if you've not already downloaded our free guide to intimacy, you'll see a link in the description area below. We cover four areas of intimacy and how you can increase and grow those in your relationship. So that will be a vital resource for you. Grab that for free. So let me start by acknowledging that not all disappointments are equal in marriage. And I want to be sensitive to the fact that I don't know where you're currently at, how long you've been enduring disappointment, what areas the disappointment is around, and understand that this may be a difficult thing for you. I also want you not to hear me say, hang in there if this is abusive. So these tips are not for somebody who's in an abusive toxic relationship. I'm not telling you to hang in there on that one. I'm telling you to get some help dealing with that, which may be distance from the person. These tips are for people who, there's lots of people who are in relationships and for whatever reason, some people when they're in a disappointing relationship will choose to exit it because they don't want to endure or deal with the disappointment over the long term and they'll choose to leave the relationship. Other people will find themselves wanting and determined to stay committed in the relationship, maybe because they have a bigger purpose behind it. Maybe some people feel that marriage vows are not to be broken. It's a covenant. And so for that reason, they want to fight through and push through, even in disappointment in the relationship. Some people believe that the best place for children to be raised are in a two-parent home with both parents. And for that reason alone, they want to fight and they're determined to stay in the relationship. And so for those people who may be struggling with disappointment, I want to give you five tips that I think can help you manage the disappointment you're experiencing in the relationship. Tip number one is simply practice daily gratitude. So listen, we all have things we can be disgruntled about, but we also have things we can be grateful about. And so when you are focused on what you're grateful for, guess what? You're going to see more of that. There's a saying that says, whatever you're looking for, that's what you'll see. So if you're focused solely on where you're disappointed, where you're frustrated, what's not happening, guess what you're going to see all the time, which is going to keep you in that place. But if you get into the daily practice of maybe journaling or verbally expressing what you're grateful for, even if it's not the marriage. So I think you can always find some things or some aspects in a relationship to be grateful for. But if you're listening right now and you're like, no, there's absolutely nothing. Okay, I hear you. But there may be other things you can be grateful for. Maybe friends, maybe family, uh, maybe a job, maybe your children, maybe hobbies or things you like to do. There is something in your life you can be grateful for. And it's hard to be both grateful and disgruntled at the same time. So if you practice daily gratitude, first about your relationship if you can, and secondly about all other things in your life if there's nothing in the relationship, you will find yourself in a better headspace, which will allow you to better manage disappointment. Thought number two is own your issues. Yeah, I know. You're probably sitting here going, you know what? I do own my stuff. And if they would just own their stuff, it would be better. And you may have a whole list of things that if they would just do these things or stop doing these things, the relationship would be great. And that may be true. But the difficulty with that is that you will never be in control of another person So it doesn't do you a whole lot of good if all the issues are them. Here's what's great news. You can own whatever you have and work on it. I don't care if you believe this marriage is 99% issues them and 1% issues you. Spend 100% of your energy on the 1% that is you because you're actually in control of that. Now the irony when I work with a lot of couples is they spend so much time pointing out what the other one's not doing or what the other one doesn't do right. And I get it. And it makes sense. And we want our spouse to do some things differently. But the irony in it is this would be a much better situation if all of the issues were you than it is if all the issues are them. Because guess what? If my spouse is not an issue in our marriage and I'm 100% of the issues, guess what that means for our relationship? I am in complete control of whether this relationship gets better or not. I can control 100% of the issues if they're all me. So rather than wanting all the issues to be your spouse, I would challenge couples and say, it would be better if it's all you. If it's all you, guess what? 
you're in complete control. You can fundamentally change the atmosphere in your relationship single-handedly. They don't have to do anything. So what I have found is that there is not a relationship where 100% of the stuff is only one person. Now, oftentimes it's lopsided. I'll give you that. Some people are way more dysfunctional than others. But if you can focus on owning your issues, spending all of your energy fixing your issues instead of spending energy trying to get them to fix their issues, which you'll never be in control of, you will be much more satisfied with the outcome because you can actually adjust it. So thought number two is you need to own your issues. That's a much better place to focus than focusing on their issues. Thought number three is prioritize yourself. What I'm not saying is be selfish. I'm not saying don't ever think about the other person, just think about yourself because it's not worth thinking about them because they're not going to do anything. I'm not saying that. You can still be selfless, but you can prioritize yourself. There are things maybe that you have neglected that give you life, that fill you up, that keep you in an emotionally healthy spot, and you are in control of your emotional, spiritual, physical, relational well-being, and so you may need to start prioritizing yourself in some areas. Maybe you have put everybody else in the family first, and maybe it's a time where you need to start prioritizing yourself. Because if you can prioritize yourself, guess what's going to happen? You're going to find more enjoyment in your life and more enjoyment personally, even if the relationship hasn't changed. And when you find yourself in a better place, guess what? The relationship gets better because you're better. A healthier you creates a healthier relationship. So you need to prioritize yourself. Don't let yourself go. Don't neglect yourself. Don't be frustrated. Don't sit in your disappointment all the time. You need to, maybe it's hobbies, maybe it's time with friends, maybe it's working out. Whatever it is for you, it's a priority to you that keeps you in a good mental, emotional, and physical headspace, you need to go ahead and prioritize those things. The fourth thought is to set healthy boundaries. Oftentimes, our struggles in relationship are around the fact that we are taking responsibility for something that is the other person's responsibility, which then makes us more resentful. So you may need to set some new healthy boundaries in your relationship to guard your own emotional health. Maybe you've been trying to change or take responsibility for your spouse's behaviors, which you don't like, which may be unhealthy, instead of just letting them own those behaviors and the consequences to them. So you may need to set some new boundaries to guard and protect yourself, right? If you've got a spouse who continually is angry towards you or belittles you or cusses at you, you may need to set a boundary and let them know, as soon as this language starts, I'm going to exit the conversation. And if they're the kind that wants to follow you around and not let you do it, then you let them know, I will exit the house. Or maybe you got a spouse who comes home drunk or drinks too much or stays out too late. You may need to set boundaries around that. So if you're going to stay out too late, the door is going to be locked when you come home. I may even change the locks because you don't want to come home on time. Or maybe you come home drunk, and if you come home drunk and angry, guess what's not going to happen? Me and the kids are not going to sit here and deal with it. We're going to get in the car and go to my mom's house or go to a friend's house or something. You may need to set some boundaries. Hey, if you're not going to do the things that you've committed to as a spouse, then maybe I'm not going to do all of the things that I committed to do as a spouse. Now, I'm not saying that from a punitive, vindictive place. I'm saying it from a healthy boundary place. If I want to give the things that a spouse gives in a relationship, my spouse is not returning those things at some point, maybe a healthy boundary for me to step back on those things a little bit so I'm not just building up resentment. So set healthy boundaries. And the fifth thought is you need to learn to manage the gap. Now, part of the reason we're disappointed and frustrated in a marriage is because there's a gap between our expectation and our reality. And that gap and how we manage that gap changes everything. So there may be some things that you're desiring that you're not getting. There's some things that you wish weren't happening that are happening. And so your expectations over here and your reality is over here and you've got this gap you don't know what to do with. Now, sometimes in relationship, we can have conversations around that and we can find compromise. And that's great to do when you can. There are other times where you have to grieve the gap. There are going to be things that you wished were present in your relationship that are not going to be present or not present to the level you wish they were present, and you may have to grieve that loss. And that's part of every relationship. Even great marriages, there's a grieving process because we're different. You may have somebody that's real affectionate and somebody that's not. The affectionate person is going to want a greater level of affection. Hopefully the non-affectionate spouse will want to take a step towards them and be a little more affectionate, but they'll probably never get to the level they really desire, and you have to grieve that gap. 
and that is in every relationship that will ever exist, there will be some gaps that you have to grieve. And so you not managing the gap is going to keep you in a place of bitterness and resentment. But if you can learn how to manage that gap, have a conversation, see if you can compromise and close the gap. But if you can't, this may require a grieving process. I wish my wife was at eight on the affection scale because I'm a 10 and I wish she was closer to me and she's a two. You know, if she moves up to a four, you may just have to grieve the gap between that four and that eight. Or if she doesn't move at all, you have to grieve the gap between the two and the eight. But there's going to be times in relationship where we got to manage that gap and what that will require is us grieving. So those are five tips that I think can help you manage disappointment in marriage better. The marriage may never change in those areas, but I think you can manage how you deal with those gaps and how you deal with the disappointment and that will keep you in a better place in the relationship. Here's the reality. You are not dependent on any other person, not even your spouse, for your own happiness and well-being. You are in complete control of that. Yes, I know that in a different relationship, and if your spouse did some things differently, that may increase your enjoyment in the relationship, but you are in complete control of your emotional, physical, spiritual, relational well-being, and so you have to take ownership of that and do the things that you need to do for yourself to stay in a good place. And when you stay in a good place, I promise you the disappointments in the marriage will not feel as severe as they are when there's a gap in your life and all those other areas. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on these five tips. And if you have some more tips, drop them because other people may want a few more tips and you may have a great one for them. So drop a comment below. If you need some videos on how to strengthen your relationship or how to get more connected, I'll tag some at the end of this and I'll see you right back here next time on Relationships.